once more, good, good morning everyone. Good morning, I uh, welcome you to our roundtable on evaluations of IM projects and strategies. A forgotten or an impossible step. And for those of you that like to know a bit more of where we are coming from and why we are asking this question, I've just put the little abstract there so you could, you know, uh, peruse it. And I'd like to introduce our panelists uh, to you. One thing is quite important, this is going to be a very, very interactive session. So we have one presentation, setting a bit the, the pace and you know, uh, looking a bit at concept, and then we will just interactively discuss. And we do encourage you to also engage and, and discuss with us interactively. So this will be different to a regular roundtable session. We really want to have like a conversation ongoing. The first part, we'd like to focus a bit on, you know, what are the challenges, what are the differences, what are, you know, the, the key issues at stake. And then the second half, we want to look a little bit, okay, what could be the solutions? What is the way forward? What can we be doing to, to, bring, uh, to bring evaluations forward to evaluate IAM projects and, and products? All right, so let me start from this end, Laura. <laughs> Very happy that uh, she is here with us. She's probably the key person on evaluation that I know, at least when it comes to ICT aspects, um, software, IAM strategies, because it has been your key or core business in the past years, with different hats coming from you know, different angles. Um, as you, as you went along in your career, but we're very happy that you're here and to, to share your expertise. Then the next uh, is uh, Nick McWilliam from uh, Map Action. He has been here two years ago as well, at and he's a constant uh, visitor, basically. Uh, he has been with Map Action for very long, I think 10 years, isn't it? A bit more. A bit more, even. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> and, um, he has uh, recently, over the past year, started to look at what impact there is in, in mapping. You know, what can maps do? Um, um, how can they be evaluated? And also doing GIS evaluation missions to, to look at uh, things. And he will actually be giving us the, the presentation to set, um, set the pace for this. Then uh, next to me, there's uh, Shelley Gonal from UNHCR. Uh, information management um, officer, key person really in information management on working out information management strategies also with a view of um, emergency situations, the context uh, for emergencies. She has, work, she has been working a long time on a toolbox, a toolkit for how can you set up information <coughs> management strategies. She's not evaluating herself, but then there is a lot of evaluation going on at UNHCR and she'll be sharing um, the concepts or the ideas uh, with us. And then we have uh, Olivier Sarah, um, formerly URD. He has been the, the project owner or the, the, the project manager of a, a, a product, ICT project, Sigma. I think some of you might know it. Maybe a show of hands, this, who knows Sigma? Okay, a few, few people um, <laughs> over there. And he'll bring actually the experience of being one whose project or whose product actually has been evaluated uh, and, and how, how did that go, how did that feel, how, how, you know, what, what lessons learned from that. But also having been with an organization for a while that actually comes from the background of evaluating. I mean, UID, Group UID is a, is a body that does a lot of evaluation and and looking at aspects and, and also sharing uh, this uh, with us. Okay, great. So without further ado, I think I'll leave the floor to Nick uh, so that he can guide us into the topic and share some of the, the aspects uh, with us. Okay, good morning everybody. And thank you very much for this um, slightly overwhelming position of talking first about something which I don't really know a very very much about, but I do have um, practical experience of trying to unpick how we evaluate. And I've been, a, as, as Sandra said, I've been a volunteer with Map Action for some time. Um, also quite independently of that, I do some work with British Red Cross doing 
GIS and IM, and also with MSF, and all of which are fa fantastic you know, contexts within which to work. And so I've had different perspectives on evaluation. And I'm, I'm not presenting anything authoritative. It's very unauthoritative talk. It's questions and ideas and experiences. Um, and I'm particularly looking at methods for evaluation. I'm not looking so much at the reasons to evaluate, because I think others will be able to look at that better. And in fact, we heard about some of those this morning. Um, if we can have the next slide, please. I'm, I don't want to base this on definitions, but I want just to give a couple of um, contexts for this talk, so we all have a common understanding of what I'm talking about. Um, first of all, the humanitarian <coughs> context. Other people might have more, say, of a development context, or training agenda, or preparedness. But broadly speaking, I think the same principles apply. This just happens to be the context for the experience that, that we've got in Map Action and for other work I've done. Um, in effect, this is describing the impact, the desired impact, against which we will evaluate our actions. Um, this is my little jargon corner down here. So let's call, this is the outcome that we're looking for. This is the outcome of the process. Um, <coughs> go on to the next slide, please. Um, then the other context, the information context, I'm talking broadly about information, especially geo-information, maps, tools, and services. Um, again, I don't want to get bogged down in what it is, but this is broadly what we're talking about. And here in the jargon corner is outputs. Um, so <coughs> obviously we have the outcomes. We want basically we are about understanding the relationship between our outputs as an IM and GIS agency and the outcomes in the humanitarian context. And in a sense, the, the outputs are the easy thing to, to describe and measure. We can easily say we've produced X maps, we've had so many site visits. The percentage of website visits that have resulted in a download or a data service. In a sense, that's the easy bit. What we want to unpick is how that connects ultimately with those humanitarian outcomes and of course, one of the fundamental challenges we all have is that, in most cases, our outputs don't have the effect of populations and communities as the direct beneficiaries. Of course, there are cases where effective populations are beneficiaries directly of information, products and services. But it's true to say, I think, that in the majority of cases, the people our products are aimed at are other humanitarian actors and decision makers. Are we happy to proceed on that basis? <coughs> um, you know, that's the sort of context within which we work. So, next slide, please. Consider causality. And what I mean is causality in the sense of cause and effect. The causes, the outputs, the maps, <coughs> the effect is ultimately the, the outcomes, the, the humanitarian benefits. And um, to take a simple case, um, this was in Nepal after the earthquake. We were working with several operational agencies on the ground. I think I've forgotten this point, it was World Vision. And every day they came to us and said, we want to get our helicopters to certain places. Can you give us coordinates of these places with a local map so we can land our helicopters there? And they said, great, we managed to land our helicopters there and evacuate people or deliver aid. And that's, you know, that's really gratifying for us. It's great. People can see the, the benefits of that. Um, and I think that's because there's a very simple causal link from the map to the result. You can see it very simply. And often you get that in an operational or logistics context. Next slide, please. But of course, most of <coughs> well, I don't know about most, there's a lot of maps. Um, when I say maps, I'm referring to all the information products, but I'll just say maps because it's quicker. Um, in most cases, things are not quite so clear cut, and you might have a, a long chain of uh, links from cause to effect. So, for example, in map action, we often make who, what, where maps, um, and we put them up on our website and on Relief Web, and we update it every day. And we do it because we think people are going to use that, but there's, there are lots of assumptions there. We don't really know that people are using it and what decisions they're, they're making with those maps and how those decisions are helping anyone. 
And here's a sort of in-between case. Um, this was, uh, I don't know if anyone knows, Anders Ludwig from the Norwegian Fire Service, who works with, also works with UNDAP, the UN Disaster Assessment and Coordination Team, um, which does very immediate assessment of, of uh, natural disasters. Um, so he had this on his own Facebook page. In Blantyre today, running our coordination centre with the Malawian Air Force. Um, yesterday, we briefed the Norwegian ambassador on the situation and showed, showed him around one of the camps for displaced people. The ambassador announced that Norway pledges 15 million kroner for the response. And here's the ambassador being briefed with one of our maps. So it's very nice for us to think the map actually helped to influence the ambassador in releasing 50 million kroner. Um, so we start to think, what if, was it the map that helped? Was the information in that map that convinced him? Was it the fact it was a map, not a table of information that was helpful? Um, so it's quite nice to help following the links in that chain if you look at specific examples like this. Um, what, so what factors can make this causal <coughs> pathway complex? And it's this complexity, I think, that makes it hard to evaluate when it's not just a simple map like the um, helicopter map. Uh, what, what I'd like to do, actually, is just spend two minutes asking you what you think. Why is it difficult to go from the cause to effect in an information product? Um, what I'm going to do is not ask you just to speak straight. I'll, I'm going to give you, um, let's say, two minutes to talk with the person next to you, or three people, I don't mind, just two minutes, and then I'm going to go around the room and I'm going to ask you what each pair of people has come up with. So why is it that it's complicated to trace a link from a map or data service or tool to a humanitarian outcome, actually an outcome for those people? And just, just pick one, one particular factor that you might think makes this a difficult uh, chain to unpick. And uh, I hope you don't mind if I include the, the panel as well in, in this uh, little challenge. So, any questions? Um, so, starting now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Mais, 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 mais,
Ouais, ouais. Mais il y a un an, c'est qu'est-ce qui fait que tu changes Je crois que c'est que tu ne peux pas changer. Je 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 ne peux pas changer. Avant, avant, c'était quelqu'un qui avait donné un peu sa petite chose, avant d'un mariage, il a fait un produit qui avait été une autre chose, 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 qui avait
what they said, like, um, basic is like the local collaboration, the local authority collaboration, and in terms of like um, understanding and implementing. Mm -hmm. So sometimes in context like MSF, yeah. it was not easy to convince that it's like for humanitarian aspects. It was always like linked to mapping, it's like maybe intelligence or whatever. In context like harsh context like Yemen or Libya, mm -hmm. it was organized <coughs> like this. So, so you mean convincing people outside the organization? Exactly, mm -hmm. like the, the, the local authorities. Sometimes like in South of Yemen, it was impossible to do mapping because it was always linked like humanitarian NGOs, um, maybe a sort of like intelligence spies. Yeah. <laughs> it was basically yes. this. Yeah, so it's, it's not just different causal pathways, it's actually obstacles in, exactly. that, in that pathway perhaps. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, let's come round to the Red Cross nominating factor. Uh, <laughs> we wondered about the element of complacency in the products that you're making, whether they are, you, regardless of the operation, maybe that you make the same kind of things to start off with, and whether they are actually appropriate for what you're doing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so, sort of inertia, mm -hmm. we've made this before, so we're so making this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the speed of feedback that you then get, if you get any feedback at all, yes. because you're a couple of steps removed from the decision. That's, the yeah, that immediate feedback. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. Great. And um, go on to the next one, please. Or the next one. Yeah, we, we talked about um, the fact that uh, it's not just one number, so it's more uh, complicated to understand than um, the uh, one, one figure. Uh, but, um, so by the amount of information, it's more uh, complex to understand. But also the visualization um, might influence the, the reader. Um, so uh, is the outcome um, based on the visualization or really on the, on the numbers? Is it yes. a, a nice map? Or yeah. Um, yeah, which relates a bit to someone else's point about the depiction. Mm -hmm. and <coughs> your point about the complexity is sounds really important. It is the situation <coughs> too complex to is it too much information to put on one sheet of paper? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, yeah. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot. Well, what we said was, I think, a bit uh, what the two first groups said. We, we discussed the lack of uh, feedback from the ground, from the actual beneficiaries. And we also said that uh, we don't know much about the other variables that come into the final decision. And yeah. you can't really pinpoint the actual weight of uh, what you've done in yeah. the decision making process. Yeah. 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 Maybe just to add, and I think it's also like challenging when you think about volunteers. I think that's also what we are doing, for example, in this maps environment. You're also trying to get more feedback from the ground, also too, because it's also a motivational factor. If you, you're you producing outcomes, data, platforms, and so on, but you don't mm -hmm. know about the real impact, I think it's also something that you uh, need to I don't quite follow. Yeah. In relation to missing maps, is this? For example, like uh, when you, like, I was just, uh, in a, if you have a lot of volunteers that are putting their time and effort, yeah. I think it was also a very important aspect to, to, to um, admire. Yes. Yeah. So in terms of motivating those volunteers yeah. to get that feedback. Yeah. Just to and say, okay, okay, that, that effort is worthwhile. Yes. Kind yeah. Of that totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Please. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we talked about how uh, there's not really like a it's, it's not really common practice. If, you're, if your IM system is a monitoring system, like to do a monitoring of a monitoring, <laughs> it's not really common practice because then you get that you know, sort of Ouroboros, like snake eating its tail kind of thing. <laughs> um, and that's, that's difficult. Uh, so, Sneaky day to tail. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, where, where do you stop? And that was, yeah. that, that was for us kind of um, what we sort of saw was just that it is difficult and not standard practice. Like a lot of, a, a lot, if you look at the log frames of a lot of information management programs when they start up, like the success indicators, number of reports downloaded, which you know we all know yeah. is you know, kind of bullshit, and it's not actually uh, an appropriate indicator. Yeah. So yeah, uh, in a nutshell, it's hard. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sometimes think it actually, the, in a sense, the fewer maps, the better. If you come to a good decision with fewer maps, it's better than the same decision with lots of maps. <laughs> Thank you very much. How did it work? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Assumption we 
started to, uh, not uh, the outcome was not a decision making process, it's a process of decision making and yeah. uh, the mapping uh, uh, I am uh, product is a key mapping yes, it's not the aim per se. And so what <coughs> means the difference between the output being a, a map or some data and the outcome to maintain outcome a positive change in the life of the people we are aiming to, uh, to serve at the end of the day. <coughs> and we talk about the fact that maybe it's difficult maybe to assist Mm -hmm. uh, the, the pathway, uh, the concept of pathway is a contribution, contribution, simply. Uh, a map is not sufficient to change the life of people, and uh, so there are different stakeholders involved, and uh, so I was addressing this one, and we're very interested in relation to this sense. Yes, yes, so just talking about um, sometimes your, your several steps removed from the end beneficiaries in order to, um, in order to, to know that you Yes, yeah, the steps of um, decision makers of um, information flows. Yes, I suppose. I mean, it's like, like you said, someone might have downloaded the report, did anybody do anything with that report? Exactly. And then yeah. Report. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. And last but not least, <laughs> could you go into two groups? Yes, yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Uh, many things have been said already, so we have several ideas which have been uh, uh, repeated by others in the rooms. The only one that we may have not heard is that uh, uh, the information management process itself may have an impact on projects that you're not measuring. But the fact you're collecting data, for example, mm -hmm. may uh, even for uh, a local monitoring and uh, evaluation officer may have another vision of the projects. And sometimes when you really interact with beneficiaries locally, may have an impact on the populations but it's not something we will trace. So that the process of uh, information management itself has an impact yes. that you're not following. Yes. Yeah. Not only the data to bring back to headquarters, but sometimes yes. even locally or in a, yeah. in a way that you cannot uh, uh, forecast. You can in mind. Uh, yes, I have an example linked to the, my own project on Sigma project that's um, the implementation of this uh, project management solution in organizations, even if it wasn't always successful to be able to have a a structured way to manage mm. projects. The way the organization has to think on how they should structure the way they should work on projects, what are their processes, etc., had a positive impact on the organization, yeah. even though it was not able to produce something. So yeah. Yeah. the thinking on the process and tools for information management can have an in indirect impact on yeah. the organization. And that's positive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Oh, another one. <laughs> <laughs> I can if you really want. <coughs> um, no, I think I think you, you can put it in so much better words than I well, <laughs> said. But um, you know, especially I mean, many of the projects that I've worked on have been about biz ops essentially. So you're trying yeah. to, well business operations. So okay. you're trying to uh, Im improve the way that your system, your internal systems work, either through M and E or it could be even. You know, it could be something that base, basic about Emily is texting your field staff to remind them to send you a number every month rather than driving out there to get a problem. Um, and in that instance, your end user of your system is not your beneficiary. And it's also at least two or three steps removed from your program. So yes, you, you will, you're improving your reporting, you're improving your operation, and you're maybe saving some money and some time. How do you prove that money you save goes on programs and increase, you know, all of these things, it's just lots of complexity. And then to, to add to that, you know, this data is not always tracked. So then if you're trying to prove the impact of an IM tool or an M&E tool or something like that, you're looking, you're asking cost about staff costs and time, say, and many of the smaller organizations I've worked with just don't have that information. Um, yeah. So it's anecdotal, so you just yeah. don't have good data for it. A lot of us could relate to a lot of those points in terms of yeah, the experience. Mm -hmm. but, well, what's amazing is that pretty much all the, everybody made quite separate points. You know, there was a lot of potential for a lot of overlap, but we actually identified a lot of um, unique factors there, and a lot which I haven't really put into play yet. If we go on to the next slide, this is, and these were just the things I quickly noted down, um, and you've come up with a lot of other factors as well. Um, I guess there's so many decision makers in the humanitarian arena, many inputs we heard about. Um, something that maybe we didn't touch on um, is the sense in which decisions are based not so much on data or evidence, but just on someone's experience of a situation, an experienced um, 
field officer <coughs> for, for a humanitarian NGO will have so much experience of that situation, they will have a, a, a <coughs> film, they'll have a heuristic that will help them respond um, in addition to any further data and evidence. Um, next slide, please. Um, I, this is the sort of model I, I visualized. I really wanted this to be an animated graphic if I had a couple of days to make it. So can you, can you visualize, please? Um, we've, got the, we've got like a cloud here of lots of maps and web services and tools and all moving around. And they, they move into this crowd of decision makers in, they might be in Geneva or Paris or London, or they might be in Juba, or they, you know, they might be in um, eastern Sierra Leone, or wherever. And so all this information is coming here, it's impacting all of these, you know, all, all the maps are crashing around. Um, there's suddenly lots of other inputs, other factors coming in, um, which may be political, they may be funding, uh, they may be local authorities, as you said. And out of that, you get your humanitarian delivery on the ground. And so what we're effectively doing is trying to say, what does this do to effect that? Or what does my organization's product strategy do to effect uh, this consequence? Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Um, I think this is going to take up a bit too much time. I was going to just do this as a group exercise to ask everybody to think of an information product and how complex is its causal effect on humanitarian outcomes and then to rank it on a one to 10 scale. Um, I think you can do that in your, mentally you can think, if you're involved in providing web service, say, you think, how directly does this result in a humanitarian <coughs> benefit? Um, I won't do this as a group exercise now just because of time, but you can think about this just as a thought experiment. Um, okay, next slide, please. So just, I, I won't spend too long on this. This is, broadly speaking, the way that Map Action has um, approached it. Um, and I think Laura can probably um, contradict me if I get things wrong, because she's actually done some of this work in a much more structured, formal, and better context. But just as a, as a conceptual framework, um, if we move to the next slide, please. Um, this is broadly following the, that causal pathway from products through to humanitarian consequences. Um, the outputs in readily accessible formats um, then move on to the decision makers, the decisions themselves, and the outcomes. Uh, if you just press, press something to get the next. Um, the stuff in blue is effectively internal to the organization, or at least under our control. We know what data to gather, we know what maps to make, how to present those maps, um, and who to give them to, or how to publish those maps and services. So we can, that we can evidence, we can measure that, it's easy, we know and we do it. And probably every one of you can think of that in your own context. When you get into the red zones, you're going into those clouds of <coughs> complexity and assumptions and um, externalities as we can call them. Um, what decision what decisions need to be made? Um, who's making those decisions? Can they read maps? Do they read the language of the map? Um, are we getting the maps to the right people? Um, in among all the other inputs, does our map actually make a difference or not? Um, and then finally, um, do those decisions then result, sorry, do those inputs result in better <coughs> decisions or not for the ben ultimate beneficiaries? That's the key question. If we didn't have that map or data, would, this, would we get a better result or a worse result? And someone mentioned what would happen if you didn't have that input. So, in effect, the challenge is to try and evidence these assumptions and there are various tools for doing it. Uh, next slide, please. We're broadly working around this concept of contributions analysis. Is anyone else going to be talking about it? Not really, <laughs> just to save me explaining it. <coughs> it I mean, this is a, a rough definition here. Um, 
basically saying we're trying to find evidence of the effect of maps by asking <coughs> people who use them to say what difference did that map make. Um, this is usually after the event. We also can do, during the event, real-time evaluation, RTE, um, which is great fun, but it doesn't really come up with very useful answers often. You try to follow a map, who's using it, what are they doing with it, and it's actually very difficult. Next slide, please. Um, if we're putting lots of effort into evaluation of IM products, I'd like to ask, just as a question for you, would, would there be a benefit in interagency evaluation? Should we get together and have one person do the evaluations for, for all the IM agencies? The benefit is, if you, say you have 10 humanitarian agencies using maps and services, they don't want 10 evaluators coming to them asking the same, roughly the same questions. It's much more efficient if you have one person going to them and asking what input did you use for your decisions and what effect does that have. So I don't know if, I, if this is happening or not, but just a suggestion. Uh, next slide. Um, um, as a general concept, it seems to me the closer, the, the better integrated the, um, the map and the user are, the easier the valuation is. Um, and in some contexts, um, particularly, with, of, particularly with MSF, I find the person making the map has a good relationship with the person who's requesting the map. And so you know that you've got a very high knowledge that that map is useful. You can see its application for the epidemiologist or the water and sanitation engineer because the map is designed closely with them. And I think that makes a huge difference. So in effect, you're simplifying that causal chain. And is there another slide? Oh yeah, sometimes I wonder basically, is this mission impossible? Are there just cases where it's too complex, as somebody suggested, and you're not going to be able to trace that um, causal evidence, that causal pathway? Um, but maybe they're still useful. Um, so that's, that's really my talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Yes, yes no, thank you very much, Nick, um, for actually setting the, setting the pace. But I do want to give the the, um, the rest of the, the panelists also the chance to to introduce themselves in you know a few minutes and actually look at those those questions. Um, is it impossible? Is it how is evaluation uh, for you? Is it an impossible step? Is it a forgotten step? And just you know give a bit your your perspective as well. Maybe you start, or you okay. Um, so for me, it's not impossible, impossible because uh, we have the chance to be evaluated and uh, after 10 years of projects and uh, the evaluation has been uh, incredibly positive for us to be able to have an external point of view on very complex and integrated issues we are facing on developing an IT project which was uh, in a multi-actor environment, multi-donors environment. Uh, so there were many issues which were interlinked uh, regarding adoptions, funding, governance, business model, uh, technical issues, uh, internal culture of the organization who was managing the project. So you can see how complex it was. So I think it's the same kind of cloud that Nick was presented. Uh, and uh, we knew that something was not working very well on the project. And we were really committed to try to make um, our decisions, to try to, uh, because we were still very committed to the objective of our project. And the evaluation has been a very important time to reflect on, on the way we're working and start to, uh, to take strategic hard decisions to try to move forward. Um, we were not so much, uh, let's say, keen to have a very strong causal link between the facts <coughs> and the decisions, but just the fact to be evaluated by an external point of view and someone who was skilled was a value in itself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we knew that we were not performing well, the evaluation said it, okay, that was not a surprise, but it was more important three, to try to understand, to have a, a complete vision. And I will fin finish my talk on that, that uh, we knew that we were not performing well. We knew that we had something like a, a not nice fit, a face which was a bit strange, uh, a missing arm, something like that. But we just knew, we in, which, we just knew uh, each one of those facts, but never we had a complete mirror to see uh, how strangely beautiful we were, and this, uh, <laughs> this, uh, 
mirror help us <coughs> to start to say, okay, that's the real situation uh, with, uh, as a whole. And it wasn't possible before. We knew all our difficulties, but uh, we had bad governance, we had a, uh, uh, an unsustainable business model, we had problems with adoptions, etc. We knew all that. But to understand uh, as a whole, and to start to have the broad links between all those aspects was really something new for us and that helped us to, to move forward and invite you to the Faith Fest uh, for discussing more about the, the next steps of the SIMA project because we are just on evolution today. Well, thanks for the very honest insight. Yeah. I much appreciate it, really. <laughs> Shelly? Okay. Um, I'm going to stand up because I can't see sure, sure. everyone's faces. <laughs> okay, so we're... I'm Shelley from Unis here. We're probably a little bit different. I'm going to come across as a big bureaucrat right now. But we have an evaluation service that's independent. It reports to our high commissioner. And we also have an evaluation policy. And so the question of is I am immune to evaluation? In my no, not for us. <laughs> we are we are held to, to account. The evaluation though is broader than just impact. There's five different factors the evaluation service will look at. One is relevance, effic efficacy, efficiency, impact, and sustainability. So, for example, with sustainability, even if it is a highly effective thing, if it, if it can't be sustained over the course of time, then it, it's, it's not worth it. Or if it's financially unsustainable, for example. Or, um, um, so, but it, I can check if anyone wants to see the policy, uh, if you're interested in adapting it to your own organization, I can see if I can, I can with Sandra, if I can release it to you if you want that. Um, uh, right now we're undergoing a big evaluation of data systems at, at UNHCR globally. There's also an interagency movement further to what um, it was Nick referring to, to do we need an interagency methodology in the grand bargain needs assessment work stream? There's a development, Patrice Chatelier is one of the consultants who is leading it, it's eco-funded for, for having a standardized methodology for evaluating multi-sectoral needs assessments. So that might be coming to an operation near you. Um, um, but one of the things that's so difficult about this is that as data dependency grows in our institutions, do you know what I mean by data dependency? Yeah, like we, we, the, the institution is hungry and demands more and more and more data. Data becomes increasingly complex and interconnected. So even deciding where one information system begins or ends becomes difficult because one needs assessment done over here can be eaten by a bigger needs assessment that comes along. A uh, sector specific needs assessment can involve the multi sectoral, etc. It's easier maybe to evaluate when information is the outcome. For example, um, to, when you want to inform <coughs> refugees about conditions in the country of origin, and then you can survey the refugees. Do you, do, were you informed by this campaign, this information campaign about what's happening in your country of origin? Or like a referral network where the, the goal of the system is to inform service providers about what other service providers are geographically near them. That's easier maybe to evaluate. The other stuff, as everyone's been talking about, is really difficult. One thing at UNHCR though is that you are responsible for both the intended and the unintended consequences of the data systems. So there's what we meant to do, right, with the data system, but also maybe what happened that we didn't mean to do. And that includes doing harm. So if you release data that does harm to a population, to a community, or to a humanitarian actor, then that's, that's part of the flaw of that project for having done that. We work in complex environments with protection sensitive data, so this is something that can happen, for example. But there's also unintended good consequences, like you release the data and it gets picked up and used as targeting criteria in assistance, and, and we weren't thinking that that's how it would be used. So both unintended and intended uh, consequences should be taken into consideration in the evaluation pro uh, process. But how does data influence decisions? A lot of people talked about this. And did anyone know about this ACAP study? They, they, they looked at how much data from a needs assessment appears in the report. And it's a tiny fraction. It was like 12% or something like that. So you gather all this data, and then only 12% makes it in. And then of that 12%, how much of that is influencing a decision? So it becomes the sliver of what was originally collected. 
But the format that you release and save the data, if you save and retain the data, you release it so that other people can use it for other purposes, then that can, that can sort of maximize the impact of that data. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll leave it there. I could, we could go on, but uh, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry. coughs> um, all right, well, I'll try and keep this brief, both because um, we want to hear from you and also because, um, quick plug, there's a workshop on Wednesday afternoon on this topic, and so I'll be holding forth more on this very dear to my heart topic then. And also because I have a cough and I probably will have to stop at some point. Um, another quick plug is that I'd really like to know where we all are with this issue of, mm. of m and &E, of tech and how how far along our journey um, in identifying that we need to do monitoring and evaluation on technology and information management projects versus actually trying to figure out how to do it versus trying it versus have tried it, found the problems, trying to solve the problems. Um, so I put a little poll on Twitter on the hashtag um, and I put my Twitter handle up there and so you can find it. I'd really love to hear from you and just learn where people are on this, how many of us are. At the moment we have 100% of people reporting that they've uh, tried it and mistakes were made. So we'll see, we'll see where we end up to by the end of our session, but I'd love to know where we all are on that. So, um, so my journey um, on this actually, I, I sort of started working on monitoring and evaluation of technology projects, um, and I'll tell you why I say it like that in a second, um, because I found the problem face first by walking into it. So I used to run Frontline SMS. I don't know if anyone's heard of Frontline SMS, but it's a little, it used to be a little desktop um, SMS sending management project um, that is now a successful cloud-based SMS sending management business, um, run by my husband actually. Um, but during that time we were a nonprofit, and one of the things our donors quite rightly wanted to know was, you know, what was our impact in the field? Who were our direct and indirect beneficiaries? And I did not have that data because we were supporting a cohort of users around the world. Um, we had, to, you know, that did, when I joined we had um, like 6,000 downloads. Um, we had many more than that eventually, but uh, we didn't know almost anything concrete. We had no numbers. And we started looking into that and trying to help our users to gather data. And it turns out that what I was saying earlier about you know people don't have this data, people don't gather it, people don't know what questions to ask, people don't have the funding to gather information about how the technology projects they're starting to use are influencing and improving and sometimes disimproving their projects. Um, so we never could get good numbers on, on frontline SMS's impact. We could get some lovely stories. Um, but one of my favorite quotes from that time in my career, um, which was actually, I think, an Ushahidi quote, was uh, the plural of anecdote is not data. Um, but that's all I have is a blog post, essentially. So, so then uh, Frontline SMS spun out as an independent company in 2014, and Simlab, which is the foundation that owned Frontline SMS, and went on as a sort of non-profit consultancy, and we decided to try and help people solve this problem from a technical and policy perspective. So we wrote a framework, um, which subsequently got to get used for the Sigma evaluation um, and then got redeveloped also with the support of the Digital Impact Alliance in 2017 um, to try and help people to, to evaluate their, their technology projects. And when we first started talking about this, obviously it took us two years to actually write the framework in our spare time. Um, we ran a session at Meltech in DC and everybody who turned up wanted to talk about how great m and &E technology is for m &E. and we kept having to bring people back to no 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 we're talking about m &E of technology not m &E using technology and no one really understood what we were saying and why that was important <laughs> um, so two years later we ran a session at Maltech in, D uh, in dc and it was packed so people have really come to realize that this is an issue but there are still structural problems that make this really tough so there, no one's going to give you an extra 10 grand on top of your evaluation budget to make sure you've got a technologist on the team who's looking at things like sustainability and rollout and training and licensing and the code base um, from a technologist's perspective who could tell you, you know, when we come to replicate this project in another space or in another place, these are the things we should do differently next time from a technology perspective. No one has that kind of funding. Or it's very, very rare to be given that kind of funding. So the Sigma evaluation was both incredibly foresighted to commission and extremely rare. I still don't know of that many other <coughs> opportunities as an evaluator to go and do that kind of work. 
Um, the criteria we use are very similar to the UNHCR ones. They're in the CINLAB um, framework and they're based on the OECD DAP criteria for development evaluation. <coughs> so relevance, impact, sustainability, effectiveness, all these kinds of things. We threw in a couple of other things that are particularly relevant, like um, coherence with other technology tools and you know, interoperability and things like that. Um, we also developed another set of criteria that are based on the digital impact, the digital principles, the principles for digital development that um, Dial owns. So you can have a look at those as well, although you still need to have some kind of sense of evaluating against your log frame or your, out, your intended outputs and outcomes. Um, and the digital principles help you look at how the technology project was, um, was run. And then, I mean, just to say quickly that um, GAHI, which I now, I now work for the Global in, um, Alliance for Humanitarian Innovation, um, our focus is on scaling innovations, um, and that's a whole other ballgame, um, both because you look at some of the same issues like sustainability and design and, and things like that, but you're also looking at why, how to, how to, so first of all you need an evidence base around that technical domain. So let's say you're running a, a project that helps you to, um, to, to support education and emergencies programs. How does it work in that domain? Is it, is it effective? What are the risks and challenges of standard evaluation? How do you then make that transferable and scalable within education and emergencies? And how can it be adapted? Is it designed effectively to be scaled? And then, what do we know about scaling innovations? Next to nothing, there's no evidence base on this. There's research, but there's no ME. So how do you then build an evidence base um, around that? And so I'll, I'll finish by just saying, you know, the why of this for me. It's so critical that we start to look at this as a field that focuses on technology for social good really broadly. My whole career is, has been very broad in terms of humanitarian and development, not just IM, not just maps, but not just mobile, but lots of different things. So as technologists for social change, how do we hold ourselves to account? How do we look for not just the intended, but the unintended impacts? How do we understand whether we are identifying and mitigating risks, let alone how well we're doing that? Um, and, and how do we hold ourselves accountable to our, to our um, our profession to try to generate evidence that will help us all do better next time. This is really my part of preoccupation. We're, we've been around, we're at least 10 years old as a field, we're probably older than that. SMS has been around for 25 years. It's time that we professionalize and we start generating this evidence base that helps us do a better job. And, and we can do that by trying to build in efforts to do m on our on our work as we go, as hard as that might be. I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> Thank you, Lola. <laughs> <coughs> oh, that's my faithful timekeeper. Oh, where do we stand on time? You have 35 minutes. Okay, that's not bad. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, that's, that's great. Um, because we did, did want, also want to look on, on the ways on how to you know, go forward on this. Unless there are kind of any pressing questions from the audience on particularly the challenges. There is some more on challenges, because otherwise I would then, after a while, switch to I have a global question. Yes, like please, go ahead. Mind. How on what we are talking about is uh, related to perfection versus good enough? Mm -hmm. Can we clarify that in the framework of this specific workshop? But I'm starting to get a bit lost in relation to this uh, pen, which is about perfection in, uh, in data and information management and good enough. So we are talking about uh, the evaluation sigma, the SMS, etc. I mean, it would be great if someone from the panelists or someone from the audience could each time try to recap how to link this to our main subject. Mm -hmm. That's actually a good idea, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good contribution. So I don't know who wants to have a go first. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not a question, um, if I take my own experience with on the Sigma project, uh, we haven't performed good enough, and I don't speak about perfection. So. Uh, the evaluations uh, has helped us to try to uh, to reach a good enough state in the sense that uh, we uh, most of the engineers who tried on piece of software have, have stopped to use it after a couple of years. So it means that invest energy on top of the very hard work you have to do on the daily basis on to manage uh, the human um, project on the field. Some people have to invest an, an extra amount of energy to start to get used to Sigma, etc. And this energy, in some way, has been partially lost for the intended objective. So there has been positive outcome unintended, but there has been partially lost. So it wasn't good enough. So we're not speaking about uh, uh, the perfections. 
in the talk that Laura just put, we could see that all that seems theoretical, that seems a great piece of knowledge for report, etc. But what is the impact uh, for people? So it could be linked more to perfection than to give enough. But actually, uh, the real practice of evaluation can help uh, concrete uh, IM projects to try to reach good enough because it's very hard to to scale up. It's very hard to uh, to have a real impact, etc. So. Um, they need to be uh, to have a dialogue between um, uh, cutting edge uh, research on this topic and concrete uh, high end projects. And I think we need to have this dialogue just to be able to to bring uh, high end projects to a good enough state when uh, when they are feeling lost. That's how I would say. Shall we? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, we're we're going to have to build a mini version of this, not the Rolls Royce, I think. And so thinking of ways to use existing resources to do that often starts with people. Um, and so that's, that's something I'm thinking about, both for this general field, but also for things about like responsible data, which is another whole area where you're trying to build in technology literacy and into it's sort of the other side of evaluation as ethics and responsibility around technology and data. It starts with the people and with sharing as much knowledge as you can, maybe. It's a good enough version. Great, thank you, Laura. Are there any other comments? Yes, please. Yeah, um, usually uh, something that bothers me all the time uh, when we talk about information management and data is that we never talk about the data life cycle and uh, also the crisis life cycle. Because most of the products that we produce, maps or other data and information products, are focused on the emergency phase. But what happens after that? Is our data can be our data be used as a service? And usually it's not the case because we we are just focusing on our organization, how to produce information for ourselves, but not for other people. But this data is useful in the long term preservation of the data as well. <coughs> how do you take that into account? I I feel like I have a slight unfair advantage because UNHCR gets involved in, in complex emergencies that tend to go on and on and on and on for <laughs> 20, 30 years at the same caseload. So we do have these, this longevity and then what we have to design is these systems that can scale up and down and adapt. We were still doing return monitoring in Iraq after the Samsara bombing. Yeah, after the civil war broke out, we were the still our systems hadn't adapted. I went on mission there. I was like, oh my God, you're doing return monitoring, and there's active displacement and emergency. So that there is that issue. But um, yeah, we're uh, the, the the longevity is, is an issue. The humanitarian development nexus is another point, and how we hand over to line ministries and government, and how we hand over to development actors and trying to use language that they can understand or to establish those connections with the National Statistical Office. There's a project called EGRIS, um, uh, which it, it encourages National Statistical Office capacity to include refugees and internally displaced persons in their censuses and other data collection activities. And this will enable us to align our data systems much better in the longer term. Great, it's, like, it's actually a good point because it brings me to the fact whoever is here around um, tonight, because this will actually be one of the questions. How can we bridge the gap between you know, humanitarian data collection and development data collection or making sure that you know, it's actually cross-pollinating? So, I, if, are you around tonight? No. Ah, what a pity, because I think this will be one of the, the key questions that we will look at. <clears throat> so whoever is interested, uh, please come uh, tonight to our event. <clears throat> okay, great. Any other uh, comments from the audience? Yeah, please, please. Yeah, uh, my name is Suleiman. I work with the GICHD, so I'm, I'm advisor for uh, Mine Action. Uh, I think Mine Action actually touched the, the question between how to bridge between uh, a conflict, an ongoing conflict, and the transition from that conflict to a development stage. Uh, and that's why we try to actually minimize the number of data that we collect just to focus on the one that have a longer life period than just ongoing conflict and can be used later on when we have a development project that touch the people life, you know, building infrastructure uh, or, you know, livelihood. So, so that, there is a lot of humanitarian projects that actually lie around this type of project. So I think Mine Action is a good example and uh, a, good, a lot of lesson learned can be uh, get from there. Uh, in the, you know, when, when I was working with conflict situation or you know, active conflict, and not just my nation. There's a lot of data that you collect that when you think in the future, oh, that could be really helpful for, let's say, for the health cluster or for the protection cluster. And I should try to promote that, you know, through maybe an interagency or, you know, the clustering system that we have in the UN to, to bridge this information somehow from whatever I have right now, hopefully within two years when that, uh, the conflict is, or we reach the ceasefire. So actually, we have a really nice diagram to actually to distinguish between a conflict, a ceasefire, stability, and then you have the development stage and how information management different 
from one station to another. And I think it's uh, available on the, on the internet if you look, co compare the information management life cycle compared to the situation of the country. Great, thank you. So I just want to build on what you're saying. I think this is also, we had a workshop related to time frame and uh, data. Uh, and I think it's a very interesting question about uh, this on the data, and it should be the government at the end of the day. And this is sort of part, of, I know in theory, yeah, yeah. but I mean, in, in theory, it's sort of part of the issue. It means if we are really handing over and uh, making uh, ensuring that the data are useful for them, because if we are handing them over that they're not uh, uh, <coughs> deemed useful for, for the authorities, they will get lost and a lot of money, and we will have not this efficiency uh, criteria method, etc. But if from the very beginning we are sitting together and we tend not to do it uh, in my 10 uh, responses, uh, if we're doing that from the very beginning, uh, I think there's really much more chance that the life cycle of the data is much longer and could be used for different purposes. As we are saying, uh, the mining operation is one thing, but return and land uh, farming, etc., is something else, which is uh, interlinked. And uh, I think the starting point should not be my 10 relief operation, but development data. And we have plenty of uh, development data available uh, across the world. Great, thank you. Can, <clears throat> can I ask one, one sort of uh, slightly provocative question to Drew? I just want to say, uh, sh see a uh, show, show of hands. I mean, is there anyone who believes, or who, like colleagues believe, doesn't need to be your own belief, that there is simply no evaluation on IM uh, products or ICT tools simply because ICT is kind of linked to innovation <coughs> and it's kind of a bit immune or it's kind of be thought to be actually, you know, effective no matter what. <laughs> no, it's, it's, not me, but yeah. yeah no, no, just, just <coughs> it, not you me. don't have to answer by yourself, but just like what is what you've seen. Is, is that a kind of view that you might have encountered in the field or in your organization somewhere? Not, it doesn't need to be your personal opinion. Okay, that's a, that's a, that's a couple of people. <laughs> it's unfortunate, actually. It is unfortunate. <laughs> it is unfortunate. <laughs> it's, a, it's unfortunate, but it's, it's actually, it's, it's interesting to look at it from this perspective, because maybe you've heard a lot about the, the challenges right now, and we also heard from, from uh, our panel that it's really, really important to, to do these kind of evaluations. But then how do you create or sensitize uh, those around you or the organizations around you that actually ICT doesn't necessarily mean innovation. I mean, it, it can go with innovation, but it's not the same thing. You cannot equate it. And what do you what do you tell them, Laura? Well, I just wanted to say that it might be that they're happening, um, but that they're secret. Mm. Um, because you know, what do we know about innovation? Is that sometimes things don't pan out, right? Or, or they don't pan out quite as we imagine. Because it's hard, um, and so maybe we're not all doing the evaluation by blog post and, and maybe we are commissioning and I know that you know part of um, much technology and innovation practice is doing a retrospective with the team doing some learning activity what I don't see so often is sharing that and in either sharing the evaluation as Sigma did on their website with the an answer and okay this is what we're going to do next which is great um, and then, and then subsequent follow-ups as well. I mean, that's been really great. It's a transparent process. It's, it's, it's not, it's painful maybe, but I think the thing is, and this is where we can all do something about it, is to lobby for that kind of openness within our own organizations as painful as it might be, because we all fail. Or we all have evaluations that aren't bringing endorsements of every single aspect of our program and our approach. But, you know, if nobody shares, then there's no culture of that. Whereas if we all share and we're open to learning and to showing that we're learning and showing that it is this journey and that not everything goes perfectly all the time, mm -hmm. then that um, sort of removes some of the risk because it's a collective action that we're taking to all share, to be committed, and therefore we can't be penalized by, say, donors for, for sharing that learning. Now, it's, it's really hard for organizations to make that decision. If, they've, they've, if something has happened that they feel, you know, especially in this age of, um, you know, being called out by, say, in the UK, th there are newspapers who really enjoy calling out a national NGO for making a mistake, and that has financial and operational consequences for those NGOs. So this is really hard, and I'm not suggesting it's easy, but I do think that's part of it, is, is um, not just doing the learning internally, but sharing it, because 
teams move on and that institutional knowledge is lost from their retrospectives, but if we can share it in some form, then it lives on. Um, and then we have the challenge of organizing it and turning it from information into knowledge, but that's a whole new, that's a different one. And that's that's the next to, to comment on that, that um, uh, scaling means um, bringing innovation out of its uh, initial perimeter and to have all the people starting to use it. So there's a question of trust uh, in, my, in my vision of scaling. And uh, many things went, didn't went as good as we expected on the Sigma project, but at least we managed to keep a level of trust from our, let's say, our core partners. And this trust is definitely linked with their, uh, I would say, the honesty in, in which uh, the way we uh, have uh, driven this, this process and <coughs> our commitment to try to be transparent and to be honest on our values. And uh, so, of course, uh, the time when we say, okay, we'll publish a report and we publish a reply we made on it was we bit of scratch our eyes. So how will we express that? How we talk to our partners, to our donors, okay, we barely fail, uh, just to give you a figure, about uh, 11 key items in the evaluations, nine were negative, two were positive, just to give you the, the level of, uh, of failing. And so, but we were really committed to that, also because of the culture of preparing to, for transparency and innovation, and it has been very positive, and we had also positive opportunities which come out of that. We have one of our partners, say, oh, maybe I can support you on this, uh, uh, post-crisis time and uh, found you some stuff etc and if we haven't been as transparent as we were it will never occur so it's really if you are committed for scaling and uh, I really encourage you to try to uh, to share your knowledge and share your lessons etc because it's only bringing positive change and uh, last but not least uh, trying to be as transparent uh, internally and externally also uh, push you to really ask yourself internally, uh, intimately of where were you wrong, why, etc. And that's the only way you start really start to learn. If you're not facing this, uh, this um, hard uh, boundary to say, I want to be transparent, you won't ask yourself as deeply the questions and potentially you won't learn as much. At least that's uh, the way I experience it. Okay, okay thanks. Anyone want to add to that? I just want to chip in on that. <laughs> that make this really hard. Um, so it's not just you and your organization and what you do, it's also what everybody else is doing and saying around you. Um, and having independent evaluation sometimes can give you a somewhat objective starting point in which to say, hey everybody, these are some systemic and structural issues we have in the sector. And if there are many evaluations, you can do a meta evaluation and you can say, hey everybody, we all have this collective problem. Um, but I think, you know, some of the challenges we have are, for example, around the way that funding is structured, say, the tying techno technology products to a project cycle is not necessarily always that healthy. And if we ever want to tackle that, we can, we can use things like evaluation to say, here are some of the challenges that these evaluations demonstrated, because we, there's a similar evaluation that sim has similar findings that says, you know, that that's an issue, for example. Um, the way that it, the way that projects funding makes you invest in technology projects can lead to a feature-rich but weak technology platform is a known problem and something that a, an evidence base can help you um, represent to say donors and others without saying making it sound like you're trying not to take the rap for your, your own failure. So I would just say it also helps you to to frame advocacy messages around environmental, structural, system issues that that it would be hard to represent without that kind of objective statement of what's going mm. on. Thank you, Laura. Ten you can minutes. Ten minutes, okay. Cool. A bit cool. <laughs> 11, 12. Cool. Uh, well, one second, I'm just going to wrap up. So um, you, you're going to get to your question because we have ten more minutes. I just, so we, I just want to point out, so we have had um, several suggestions on, on the way forward. One was really open sharing, encouraging um, your inside your organization that, you know, that evaluations of IM products, processes, services, and, and ICT tools are necessary. And the other one was um, just honesty, wasn't it? Like really being honest and also being open and, and actually look really 
drill down and actually be honest to yourself or be honest to your organization as well <laughs> and outside. Yeah. So and as an important for trusting, for uh, putting trust, trust yes. for scaling. <laughs> yes, okay, so we have uh, those four points. Mm -hmm. So there's one more question over there. Yeah, and I think it's maybe just adding another thing to that is when we talk about evaluation of projects, whether it's wash or shelter or health, usually we have a, a baseline and end line for which we can me measure change and say, okay, that impact um, in the evaluation, we we kind of know where we started. I'm not aware, that may be because of my more M and E background than I am, of any baselines that are done before evaluations. Um, is that something that exists, is done, can be shared? That would be very interesting. It's an excellent point. <laughs> 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 Um, there are nine, I think. Um, but uh, if I were to then come to try and measure against those at the end, very, very few projects would have collected the data that would have been able to tell me how we did. So there are some things that you can do qualitative, like did you do design work? Is Can I see the, the outcome notes from the workshop, for example? And I can do some like focus group discussions to talk to people about how well that went and how, how involved they felt beneficiary communities were in design and things like that. But there are some things that require um, numbers and that we don't collect the numbers for. And so I think this is a real case <coughs> for you know, evaluation being a whole of project cycle uh, endeavor and, and having and knowing ahead of time what you want to hold yourself to account against and, and gather on the data. I, I don't know if this is quite answering the same question, but. Um, we got quite involved in, <coughs> um, which I, going back to a previous question, in longer term, let's say, preparedness, data preparedness projects, which are generally capacity building um, following emergencies, so capacity building of a na national disaster management authority. And through Map Action, we're doing this in Central Asia, the Caribbean, and the Pacific at the moment. Um, and so, in those cases, we often, well, we all, always actually will start with a an evaluation of what exists. For example, the one I was working on, the Central Asia uh, Disaster Risk Reduction and Emergency Situations Agency. Um, there's a massive acronym. And <laughs> they, so we do evaluate you know, the staff, equipment, the data sets, the mandate, the products, that, and so on that they've got. And that, that is effectively establishes a baseline for work plan and for further evaluation. So I don't know if, that's, if that helps. Yeah. If that's the sort of thing you had in mind, so even when it's a, not a tangible humanitarian um, output, at least in an information context, we have been doing some of that sort of before pre-project evaluation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you create, uh, thanks, are there any more points? Okay, then. And now I have my, we have another question to you, to the audience. Um, have you actually uh, come across or experienced any um, uh, monitoring uh, evaluation um, on IAM project or IAM projects that you've like that you've been been part either of the evaluation team or you've actually been evaluated or your your session or um, the session <coughs> was evaluated and and. Um, if yes, how did that go? Was it was it a positive experience? Was it um, a negative experience? Or what are what are lessons learned from that experience? Maybe let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. I actually was in both. Uh, I do an IM assessment before we do any project. We go to the program in the country and try to see. Uh, we have different uh, frameworks like the resources, the 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 SOPs or the law that exists to help them to to, to do their IM work. The framework that they are situated in within the organization, uh, also the, you know, the, the training, the resources that they have. Uh, but also, I was involved in being evaluated in some of the tools that the project that was done. And I was surprised that uh, I wasn't there when they make the decision to go into this type of uh, building, going to a programmer asking to, hey, can you develop me a mobile application? And I was upset because you know, even the evaluation itself was not considering about the facts, 
why did we even go to this product? Why we didn't just buy something from the, get something off the shelf, which costs us like few, uh, you know, maybe two, 30, 40,000 and we finish, instead of paying half a million dollars to have a program that is useless. Mm -hmm. You know, that's already have been invented by other organizations. So these are questions that was, I was upset, I was, you know, and I was expressing that to the evaluator. I was trying to be as honest as was possible, uh, which is a very, very important <coughs> issue, especially in this situation. And, I, and my aim was to introduce to the organization that they should have some, some type of committee or a, a framework or a process to agree or agree, you know, do a SWOT analysis before even you start the project. Uh, and then do another, try to differentiate between the baseline before the, yeah. the you know, before we started and after we started. <coughs> you know, because sometimes it's difficult to actually measure within one year of the project. And, and that was kind of frustrating for me. <laughs> Different levels. Yeah. Was was there is, is there like any was there any way forward like anything where you actually managed to, to turn that around? Actually, uh, uh, when they did the evaluator, when they did the report, actually seventy percent of that report was based on what my feedback, my own. Even we have different other tools and different other people, and uh, and the evaluator came back to me and said like, after we met you, we changed the whole questionnaire, we changed the whole process, and we decided to reevaluate everybody else based on my comments. Uh, everybody said, oh yeah, my project is good, blah, blah, blah. Okay, how many, how many people are using it? Uh, I don't know. Like, how many, how many times was downloaded? Oh, I think maybe five times. So, and how much does this cost? You know, five figures? So I was like, okay, you no problem. <laughs> respond to that. Sometimes I think we, um, I came from the private sector before I became a humanitarian, yeah. and in the private sector we had a much more rapid cycle of evaluation, so that a project wasn't allowed to continue for very long without these sort of checkpoints that happen. And when you get so invested monetarily or time-wise into a project and it stretches on for years and it's hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, the, <coughs> the ability to change course, it's too late. And, and people become so invested that they become very defensive emotionally of the evaluation results. And if we had, quit, like further to what Sonia was saying about the minimum, the minimum viable product, and if we if we if we went with smaller modules, evaluating more periodically, quicker, then that emotional investment is less. The acceptance of the evaluation results are, are, is higher, and the ability to change course more rapidly is there. It's the entrenching that happens and the investment that happens over time. And I don't know why we do it that way. Yeah, that's actually a very important mm -hmm. takeaway. So it actually would be better to, to build an evaluation in, in smaller steps and faster and, mm -hmm. and to actually uh, you know, make it really worthwhile instead of wait until you know, the project is almost completed or is completed and then do an evaluation and everybody feels really like, oh, you know, that we have that information during, you know, like like in uh, to, uh, to have like an agile approach and really build it in in the next iteration, it would have been useful. But now at the end of the project, it's really hard to deal with it. I mean, so are there any evaluators here? Yeah. So how do you feel about adaptive <coughs> management? Uh, I just went through a methodology on adaptive monitoring, and I found it very boring, nothing new. Right. So this is what I hear from every evaluator I talk to. It's like, oh, yeah, like, where have you been? You're supposed to use your monitoring data like this. What? This is what we've been telling you. Like, very offensive. Like, I've been here for 20 years telling you this is how you're supposed to use your monitoring data. And actually, like, this is one of my pet peeves, is we do monitoring data that's about impact, like development impact or humanitarian impact. We don't do monitoring on system health or system use or, you know, like, the, the technology stuff. We don't look at it. As to, to help us mon actually run a program, and then we do an evaluation and are, are like, oh, but that data should have been coming in, and so I think it's about making your log frames and all your indicators really relevant to your program, so that you want to look at it as you're going along, and making it part of like decision-friendly monitoring data would be great, and then you could then you could have more of a sense as you're going how it's going, and you can pull the plug or pivot or whatever it is earlier. I think. And, and all these disciplines need to go to a bar and meet and have a conversation and come together more. 
just to add on this one and the Maria experience, I think there's also another issue at stake here. It's in relation to the Madonnas and the domestic urgency. <laughs> and we are even not at the level of good enough, I'm sorry to say that, because even if we are not evaluating uh, specifically an information management system, when you're looking at the project, you're always looking at the part of the information management system within the project. And you are looking at the regular data which are gathered, collected, and uh, how they were analyzed, and how they were also instituted in reports. And the quality of reports is very uh, low in terms of quality. It's already very activity focused. And here we are talking about outcomes and, impact and how eventually some information, ma uh, information management tools, products, or strategies have used, have been used and uh, properly uh, served to uh, achieve some outcomes. We're far away from that uh, in the real world, I'm sorry to say that, in the human term world at least. There's really a disconnect between that in terms of quality. But here we are really talking about maps. Uh, but maps can be translated into reports also. And uh, I think there's really a misunderstanding on what could be extracted from an information management product. Uh, I want to make my point clear that. Um, no, it's not clear. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with you about um, that there is a mismatch of donor level and about that. For me, this is all about getting the data into, getting the information and recommendations in some of these reports into people's brains as actionable information. Is that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're talking about quality and those five criteria, not the nature criteria, and the evaluation, which they really use them. But in terms of relating them again with the good enough uh, perfection and the information management products and strategies, that's such a gap, you know, in what we're talking about. And uh, my point is also that we should never uh, forget about the evaluation and information management products when we look at the project per se. You know, and uh, you cannot separate just focusing on one uh, specific aspect of the project. Okay, everyone else. <laughs> 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 we are at the <coughs> Well, well, thank you. Thank you very much. This was, was an excellent session, like very interactive with lots of input from the audience. We have also uh, have a few key aspects on, on where, where there is a way forward. So we need to build them. And um, I think there will probably be more at your, yeah, at your workshop. Take the poll or find a friend who's on the Twitters and get them to take it for you. <laughs> um, and, and comes to fail there. Yes, so the, fa the fair fest is actually uh, this afternoon, late afternoon. Six, six, five. Five. Yeah. five. So I invite everyone to, to come there. Again, for this uh, evening session, this is the question about building the bridging the gap between development and development. And um, uh, again, at, uh, Wednesday is Laura's workshop. Yeah, the workshop. Afternoon, it's actually in theory. But we gonna we gonna find out because Laura said she's she's happy to take uh, to take more people. So if some of you haven't registered for the workshop and you think oh this is really going to be relevant, we're gonna check whether it's possible to put more people in the room and then we all will indicate because Laura said she's happy to take people. Yeah, so come and let me know if that's you. And but I'm pretty sure it's gonna be okay because it's the last. Thing. <laughs> I also have my hopes up that you know, whoever of you hasn't been signed up for this one and wants to go, I think you'll probably find the spot for you. Okay, great. So then we are now breaking for lunch. It's upstairs, so everyone uh, please please go upstairs. Take your cups with you, you know, if you relinquish your cups, <laughs> it's hard to get a new one. You have to pay for it. You really want to hold on to it. And then it's we're going to restart at 1.30 with the workshops. You have them indicated in the different rooms. Um, and yes, enjoy your lunch. Bye now.